This sermon is titled 1 Thessalonians part 2. Be enriched as you listen. You can turn your Bibles please to 1 Thessalonians. We have been taking time to study God's word. We are journeying through Paul's epistles, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. We began this last Sunday. I'm going to just quickly recap some of the things we mentioned last Sunday, and then we will move forward in chapters 3 and 4 of 1 Thessalonians. I don't know if you are excited. I am excited. <laughs> Amen? I love God's Word. I love to just spend time in God's Word and just, you know, just enjoy God's presence through His Word. It's so, so wonderful. 1 Thessalonians, some background to this. Uh, if you look at the map with me, Paul began his second missionary journey. This was approximately AD 49 to 52, around a two to three year periods, uh, approximately. He left his home church, city, home city, home church in Antioch, northern part of Syria. Now, in Bible times, New Testament times, there are two cities called Antioch, so don't confuse them. There's Antioch in Syria, which you'll see up on towards the northern part of Israel. There's also Antioch in Sidia, which is in central Turkey. So that's a different Antioch, right? So these are two different cities that we read about in the book of Acts. So Paul leaves his home church, Antioch of Syria. He goes west to Tarsus, which is his hometown. And from there, uh, he actually leaves Antioch along with Silas. So the two of them there, Paul and Silas, they go on the second missionary journey. They come through um, Tarsus, and then they go through the district of Galatia that has three major cities, Derby, Lystra, and Iconium. They are tri it's a tri-city area. And there he, he finds this young man, Timothy, who, who says, join us. So Timothy joins this team. So you've got three people there. And then they are journeying further west, um, central Turkey, also in Bible, is, in Bible times was known as Asia or Asia Minor. Uh, we know Asia is like, okay, we talk about China and other parts, but in Bible times, this was a part of the Roman Empire. So it was referred to as Asia or Asia Minor, the part of Asia that belonged to the Roman Empire at that time, which today is modern day Turkey. So he comes through central Turkey. He wants to do ministry there, but the Holy Spirit says, no, don't. So he moves further down. Uh, he wants to do ministry there. Holy Spirit says, no. So on two occasions, and read this in Acts 16, the Holy Spirit said, don't do anything here. So he quietly comes to Troas, which is on the seaport, on the west coast of Turkey, and there he has a vision. Come over to Macedonia and help us. So he realizes God wants us to go over to Macedonia. Macedonia was a, no a district in the northern part of Greece, northeastern part of Greece, and Luke, the gospel writer Luke, who also wrote the book of Acts, he joins the team in Troas, and they sail across over into Macedonia. And they travel through some of the cities in that district. They come to Philippi, and we know what happened. He, there's a church that is established in Philippi. But again, there's persecution there, so they move down to Thessalonica. In Thessalonica, they're barely there for um, uh, four weeks, just less than a month, three Sabbath days. Uh, they minister there. A lot of Gentiles, Greek, Greek speakers, become believers. Some Jews become believers. But again, there's persecution there from the Jews. They've got to leave Thessalonica. They go down to Berea. And they come to Berea. There again, these same Jews come chasing after them. So get out of our place. They chase them out of Berea. And then... What do they do? They come to the coast. They take the sea route down to Athens. Now, if they had journeyed on land, it would have taken them about 12 days. They take the sea. They reach Athens in about three days. And Athens at that time, like we mentioned last week, was the intellectual capital of the world. The great Greek philosophers, about 300 years prior to Paul's arriving, uh, philosophers like Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, were, were all there in Athens. So Athens was well known in those times for science, art, and philosophy. And Paul, uh, he comes to Athens. Sorry, I think the mic is... He comes to Athens, and then f there he sends Silas and Timothy, saying, go back to Thessalonica. You know, I'm, I'm really concerned about 
the people there? How are they doing? So he sends them back to Thessalonica, Silas and Timothy, go check on them. He spends some time there in Athens. And in Athens, this is in Acts chapter 17, something amazing happens. Paul gets invited to speak at the Aeropagus or speak to the Aeropagus at Mars Hill. Aeropagus is the elite intellectuals of Athens. It's a small group of about 20, 21 people or less. These were the, you know, the, the top thinkers of that time. And they would investigate any new idea, any new teaching, any new philosophy to say, yeah, this is worth paying attention to or not. And can you imagine, Paul gets invited to speak to this group of people at Mars Hill. And he stands and he preaches Jesus to them, preaches the good old gospel to them. And it's wonderful to know that during, in that group, some people become believers, become believers. And so work is established in Athens. And then he moves on from Athens to Corinth, which is on the uh, south, southern part of Greece. Corinth at that time is a sin city. Athens, the intellectual capital, Corinth, a very sinful city. Depraved, corrupt, evil, immoral. Their people worshipped this Greek goddess and uh, that her temple had over a thousand prostitutes serving in that temple. So it was a very depraved city. Paul spends about 18 months uh, uh, establishing a church in Corinth. While he is there, Silas and Timothy come down, come back, come to him at Corinth, and they give him an update on what is going on in Thessalonica. And Paul then writes these two letters to the believers at Thessalonica. You with me so far? Right? So that's the background to these two letters, the first uh, letters of Paul, first and second Thessalonians. Now in these letters, he's reminding the believers of things he has already taught them. When he was there for about four weeks, he taught them certain things. And so this letter is saying, I'm reminding you of the things I've already spoken to you. Don't forget those things. Secondly, he wants to encourage them because they are in the middle of persecution. There are the Jews who are persecuting them. So he wants to encourage them. Be strong. Don't give up on your faith. And thirdly, he reminds them of the hope we have in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, we're going through some hard times here, but we are looking forward to that glorious time with our Lord Jesus Christ. And that fills us with hope here and now as we journey through some rough times on earth. So he reminds them of the coming of the Lord. Amen? So we saw that in chapter 1, he commends these new believers about their faith, love, love, faith, and hope. Their work of faith, their labor of love, and their endurance through hope. He commends them. In chapter 2, he reminds them about their example, the life of Paul and his team. Paul, Silas, Timothy, uh, uh, he says, you know, you saw us. How we lived among you. So he reminds them of their life. We pick up today in chapter 3. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. What else does he speak to them? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to read a few verses at a time and examine what Paul writes to these new believers. Remember at this time, these believers have, have been in the faith just for about a year. So they're not, you know... Believers who've been there in the faith for a long time. It's very short, just about a year. And these are the things he is writing to these new believers. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Let's read together, please. Or follow with me, right? Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother, and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this for in fact we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened and you know for this reason when I could no longer endure it I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. So Paul is writing to 
these believers in Thessalonica, and he's just expressing his heart. You know, he said, guys, I really, sorry, this is simple paraphrasing. <laughs> I really care about you. I want to know how you're doing, and I just couldn't take it anymore. So I decided to send Timothy to you to check on you. So he says, I sent Timothy to you to find out how you are doing. But what I really want to point out is notice how he refers to Timothy. Now, Timothy, at this time, was a young man, probably just in his 20s. Some say, you know, some, some uh, commentaries may say he was 17 years of age, probably somewhere there, 70 to 20, very young man. And he had the privilege of being part of the team with Paul. And he's been with Paul just barely for a year. But look at how Paul calls, refers to Timothy. Look at that. In verse 2. Timothy, our brother, and minister of God, and fellow laborer, or co-worker. Say, hey, Timothy. Timothy is my brother. He's a minister of God. And he's a co-worker. So, yeah. Yeah, this butcher is <laughs> this little fellow. He's a minister of God. He's your co-worker. But look at how Paul, he really puts honor. He really, you know, recommends Timothy in with such a great word. He says he's a minister of God. But that's a lesson for us, right? That if we can nurture people, if we can lift people up, we can believe in people and raise them up, they will reach their full potential in God. And that's exactly what happened to Timothy. This is AD 49, AD 50. AD 68, or you could go back a couple of years, AD 66. In about 15 years from now, just before the apostle Paul is beheaded, what does he do? He appoints Timothy as the bishop or the leader of the church in Ephesus. And Ephesus is one of the most prominent, most influential churches are, are situated on the west coast of Turkey, the church in Ephesus. And Timothy is appointed as the leader. But it didn't happen by accident. Paul was nurturing him from 10, 15 years ago. Are you listening? So we need to nurture young people. Amen? And put honor on their lives. Speak good of them. Speak well of them. Trust them with some responsibility. Imagine, Paul is sending Timothy, go check on those new believers in Thessalonica. Some of us will say, where's your BDM div? <laughs> where's those degrees? Before I can send you on any assignment. But he sends him. Go there. And he sends Timothy in the same verse. He says to establish you and encourage you. He's sending a young man to establish and encourage those believers. It's on assignment. Now, I can just imagine Timothy, my life, oh, God, help me. <laughs> How am I going to do this? First assignment, just by himself. You got to go and encourage and establish these new believers. Must have been shivering, shaking. But that's how he trained him up, got him ready. And one day he became the leader of the church in Ephesus. The other thing I want to point out is that, you know, we can help each other. We can encourage and establish one another in our faith. God uses people to help people. God uses imperfect people to help perfect, imperfect people. And we don't have to be perfect in order to be able to help somebody else. No, God just, it's God doing the work and all our weakness and our imperfections is God just used me. Maybe I can establish and encourage somebody else in the faith. Amen? And God, Paul sent Timothy. Timothy, go do this. And he did it. God can use you. You're a young man, young woman, 
whatever age you are, God can use you to establish and encourage somebody else in the faith. The other thing I want to just point out from these verses is, you know, Paul says, you know, verse 3, I don't want you to be shaken by these afflictions because I want you to know we are appointed for this. In other words, look, hardships, persecutions, is part of this calling. Jesus said, you will be hated by all men for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. So you're going to be hated. People are going to hate you, but you've got to endure. You've got to stand firm. Don't be shaken by these afflictions. I don't know what you might be facing. Maybe some people, you know, may be laughing about your Christian faith or laughing about your stand for integrity or holiness. They may be mocking at you. What would you, you Holy Joe? I remember in school they used to call me Holy Joe. It'll be back in Bishop Cotton's, right? It's a long time ago. But, I, you know, just because of my faith, my friends used to laugh at me. They used to call me names, but I didn't care. You know, and two years, both my 10th grade and 12th grade, I got the best outgoing student. I said, okay, now will you tell me what you want? <laughs> they can't do anything. Hey, you call me what you want, but I got the award. <laughs> anyway, sorry, that's a side note. <laughs> so people are going to call you names. They're going to laugh at you for your faith. And then they're going to laugh at you for your standing up in holiness. Or they're going to laugh at you for your integrity or for you to be a, you know, every, what do you do on Sundays? I go to church. You go to church on Sundays? Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I do. What do you do on Saturday nights? I go to youth meeting, pit stop. <laughs> I go to worship Jesus. I mean, even Saturday you go to pit stop, Sunday you go to church. What's wrong with you? Nothing wrong with me. It's just normal. <laughs> People may laugh at you, but you don't, you are not shaken by these things. You're called for this. You're appointed for this. It's part of the deal. It's part of the journey. You stand firm in your faith and you don't let these things shake you in your walk with God. But Paul is concerned. Look at verse 5. He says, you know, uh, I, I wanted to know about your faith, lest by some means the tempter has tempted you. Think about this. In the natural, they are facing persecutions from other Jews. But Paul is also concerned about another enemy. He's saying, I'm concerned that the tempter may have tempted you and pulled you out of the faith. So there is this natural thing that he's facing, that they are facing. But Paul is also aware that there's an enemy that would take advantage of these situations. To get them out of their faith. So says, look, I just want to make sure the devil didn't get his way with you to tempt you out of your faith. Right? So we must be aware of the spiritual dynamic. There's an enemy that's trying to get people out of the faith. So we got to fight and we got to pray and do our part to establish and encourage people in their faith. Amen? Let's move on. Verses 6 through 8. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live. If you stand fast in the Lord. So Paul is saying, okay, Timothy's brought us good news. He's come back. So remember, they are now in Corinth. Silas and Timothy, they've come back. They brought the good news. And it says, Paul, Paul says, you know, I, we've been so comforted. When Timothy came back and told us, you guys are doing well. But look at that last verse, that verse number eight, sorry. For now we live... If you stand fast in the faith. Think about that. What's he saying? He's saying, look, this is what life is. We live. If you stand fast, you stand firm in the faith. So this is life for me. We live if you stand firm in faith. This is what it's all about. 
and as ministers of God, as people we, as we serving one another. For us, we want to see others stand firm in their faith. Now we live if you stand firm in your faith. If you are firm, established, unshaken. That's life. That's what Paul is saying. We want to see others stand firm in their faith. Verses 9 through 11. For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy which we rejoice for your sake before our God. Remember those men, you guys are making us so happy. Verse 10. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. So Paul is saying, look, we are so happy. You're, you're making us so happy. But we are still longing to come to you and perfect what is lacking in your faith. I was thinking about that. It's a good thing. First of all, for ourselves to know this about ourselves. That there are things lacking in our faith. And that we need to be perfected in those things. It's a good thing to know that. It's a good thing to know, God, these are areas in my life that I need to be perfected. That I need to be strengthened. These are areas in my life. So it's, it, we, don't, we shouldn't be saying, you know, I got it all together. No. There are areas in my life that I need to be perfected. And we need to do the same thing for other people. He says, we are longing to come to you so that we can perfect what is lacking in your faith. So as we look, as we serve one another, as we encourage each other, let's help perfect one another in areas where we are lacking to help complete that, fill in the gaps in what's lacking in our faith. But look at verse 11. What does Paul say? Look, while he's longing to go there, he says, May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. So saying, you know, we really want to come. We really want to perfect what is lacking in your faith. But may God make a way. May God make a way. Now remember in chapter 2, last week, Paul expressed this. He said, we wanted to come to you time and time again, but Satan hindered us. So we wanted to come, but the enemy was obstructing. Of course, it's through the people, through all the persecution. The enemy was obstructing. Satan hindered us. And so as he's continuing to write, remember it's written as one letter. He's reflecting back on the same thought. I want to come there. I want to perfect what is lacking. May God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ make a way for us to come to you. In other words, Lord, I'm leaving this to God. Now. Take a little trip with me. To his third missionary journey. We'll come back to this journey. It's not over yet. But AD 49 to 52 was his second missionary journey. About two to three years. He goes back to his hometown, uh, Antioch. He's there for about a year. AD 53 to 58. About four to five years. Paul goes on his third missionary journey. In his third missionary journey, he journeys through the exact same route. But this time, when he comes to Ephesus, which is a port city on the west coast of Turkey, he spends three years in Ephesus. Remember on his second missionary journey, the Holy Spirit said, don't do anything in Asia. Third missionary journey. He's there in Ephesus. And through that work in Ephesus, Churches are planted all across Asia. 
You remember in Revelation chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is speaking to the seven churches in Asia. How were they planted? When were they planted? Paul spent three years in Ephesus. And he nurtured people. And they went and they planted churches all across that region. Powerful. And then he gets to go twice into Macedonia. So in a second missionary journey, he said, I want to come to you. I'm trying to come to you time and again, but Satan's hindering us. Third missionary journey, twice he's going to Macedonia, coming back. He sends Timothy. He sends another co-worker called Erastus. He sends them over doing great work in Macedonia. That is that district of Macedonia where there are these churches of Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. Great work is done. But what impresses me so much is in this third missionary journey that Paul took, he nurtured, he raised up leaders in all these churches, especially leaders from Macedonia, that is from Thessalonica and Berea. And we have these Greek sounding names in Acts chapter 20. We read about Gaius and Sopater from Berea. Aristarchus and Secundus, sounds like Tintin's comic. <laughs> Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica. But these are the young men Paul raised up as leaders during his third missionary journey. And was so powerful. What's the message here? In his second missionary journey, he wanted to go, but he couldn't. What did he say in verse 11? May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. God, I'm leaving this in your hands. You know my heart. I want to go. I want to perfect what is lacking among them. I want to go and serve them. But Satan's hindering. There is opposition. There's all these troubles. I can't go. But God, you direct my way. And sure enough, when you look at the third missionary journey, a powerful work is established in Asia and a powerful work is, raised, is established in Macedonia and the next generation of leaders are all raised up. Powerful. Amen? The point is this. God's got his timing. Amen? He's got his timing. And sometimes you, just, you and I just say, Lord, I know you, I, I want to do this, but I am leaving this in your hands. Like verse 11, Lord, you direct my way. And God will bring it together so beautifully in his time. Amen. Moving forward, verses 12 and 13. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So now in verses 12 and 13, after Paul has said, okay, I want to come to you. I want to perfect what is lacking in your faith. But for now, I'm leaving that matter in the Lord's hands. He's saying, okay, the rest of my letter, I'm going to address some things that I want to address. There are three things he mentions. May you increase in love more and more. I want you guys to increase in love. Second, so that you may be established, so your heart may be established in holiness, blameless in holiness. And you'll be ready for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So three things, and these are the things he's going to address in the rest of the chapters, chapters 4 and chapter 5. But let's think about some of the things he's saying. He's saying, I want you to increase in love so that your heart will be established blameless in holiness. So think about the connection. Increase in love so your heart can be 
established in holiness. It tells us something. It tells us that we cannot walk in holiness if we don't walk in love. Sometimes in our old Pentecostal traditions, we have so emphasized holiness. Don't do this, don't do that. Stand up, sit down. Don't smile. There's no love. And we end up with some form of legalism. But holiness flows out of love. Increase in love so that you can establish your heart in holiness. The heart has to be established in holiness if the life is going to be holy. But then for the heart to be established, you have to walk in love. So, okay, increase in love so that your heart can be established blameless in holiness. And then the rest of the things will follow. Okay? So walk in love so that you can walk in holiness and be ready for the coming of the Lord. So we go to chapter 4 now. In chapter 4, he kind of elaborates on what he is teaching these believers. He's reminding them of things he has already spoken to them. And he says, this is what I want you to do. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 1 to 8 is one of the strongest passages teaching us about sexual purity. Let's read it. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 1 to 8. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us, how you ought to walk and please God. So he's saying, you know, we taught you how to walk and please God. Now we want you to increase in that. We want you to abound in living in a way that you can please God. So I want to teach you how to do that. And he says in verse 2, For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. That means the things we taught you were just not our own ideas. They were commandments that we gave you through Jesus. Verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testify. For God did not call us to uncleanness but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So Paul is writing a very strong, clear message, calling these new believers to a life of holiness, a life of sexual purity, specifically. Now think about what these people were actually exposed to in their society. We're talking about Greece. We mentioned Athens was the intellectual capital, but Corinth was the sin capital or a sin city. And so the Greek culture in those days was inundated with ideas and practices of Depravity of sexual impurity. It is part of the culture. And we talk about 2,000 years ago. And here are these new believers. People who become, come to faith in Christ. And Paul is saying, I want to remind you of what we commanded you to the Lord Jesus. This is the will of God, your sanctification. I mean, the word sanctification sounds very big and difficult. It simply means that you should be holy, that you should be set apart for God. 
This is God's will for you, that you should be set apart for him. And you should abstain, stay away from any form of sexual immorality. Stay away from it. And then he says that each one of us should know how to possess our own vessel. How do you, how we should manage and control our own body, vessel, talking about our body, in Sanctification, meaning holiness, and honor, meaning respect. Hold yourself together. Hold your body together in holiness and in honor. Just, that's what you and I are called to do. That's what we must do. And he says in verse 5, not living in the passion of lust like the Gentiles. Meaning, look, the world around you, people are just giving in to all their ungodly passions. You don't do that. You don't live like that. That you and I as believers, we are choosing a life of holiness and honor. Amen? That's what we are called to. And that's the will of God for us. Holiness and honor. And you control, you manage your own body. Keep it in holiness and keep it in honor. Keep it that way. And then he says, none of us should go beyond or reach beyond what we should be. None of us should go and defraud our own brother. Don't cheat your own brother. So what's he referring to? Any form of adultery. So imagine two people, they're married but they get out of their marriage covenant, they get into a sexual relationship. What are they doing? They're not only hurting themselves, because he, you know, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, Paul says, when you commit sexual immorality, you're hurting your own body, you're hurting yourself, but you're also cheating, you're defrauding your spouse. So don't do that. Or two people who are not married, they get into a sexual relationship, they are destroying their own bodies. Don't do that. And they are affecting their future spouse. Don't do that. So it says, no one go beyond and defraud your own brother in this thing. Why? Because God is the avenger of all such. God is watching. And he's going to do his part. So don't do that. So one of the strongest passages calling us as believers to a life of holiness specifically stay away from all forms of sexual immorality now any expression of sexual gratification outside of God's design is perversion it's impurity so today the world around us is so confused And all kinds of things are happening around us. But Paul says, that's not how you and I live. Not as the others. Who are living to fulfill their lustful desires. Don't live like that. So, so what? In your, if when you go to school or your college or your place of work. And, you know, they come up with all kinds of ideas and uh, and. and, and discussions on how they want to express their sexual gratification. So what? You choose to stay with what God has designed. You know that God has called you to holiness. You know that God wants you to hold your body in holiness and in honor. And that's what you'll do. Amen? Don't let the, the world around you influence you. They're going to have their own, you know, live according to their own lustful passions. But you choose to answer God's call. He has called you to holiness, not to uncleanness. You live holy. You choose to do that. You manage your own body. You control your own body uh, as a vessel of honor. And then he says in verse 8, you know, Whoever rejects this 
They're not just rejecting man, but they're rejecting God who has given us his Holy Spirit. So if you and I say, hey, no, 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 no. This is our pastor is talking chumma. He's an old man. Who knows? He who rejects this. You're not rejecting man. You are rejecting God who gave us his holy spirit. So this is not just whether you listen to some other man's opinion. It's not a man's opinion. This is God who's given us this instruction. And he's God has entrusted you and me as believers with his Holy Spirit. Honor God. Let's move on. Verses 9 and 10. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. So he's addressed the matter of holiness. Now he's addressing the matter of brotherly love. And he says, okay, you guys are really good at this. You love each other, but we want, you to, we want to encourage you to increase more and more. Love each other more and more. And I think this is so significant, especially because of the environment they find themselves in. They are in an environment that is surrounded and filled with hate. There are other people around them, the Jews, who are hating them, persecuting them, coming after them. And Paul is saying, you just keep growing in love. More hate coming at you, more love flowing out of you. More hate coming at you, more love flowing, flowing out of you. Just increase in love. Increase in this. Just give it up. Love one another. Just keep increasing. And then he goes on. Verses 11 and 12. That he also aspire to lead a quiet life. To mind your own business. And to work with your own hands as we commanded you. That you may walk properly towards those who are outside. And that you may lack nothing. So now he's getting really practical. He says, okay, as believers, here's the next thing. You're walking in holiness. You're walking in love. Okay, this is how you live. He says, I want you to lead a quiet and peaceful life. Now, I think we need that. Life can get so busy, so noisy, all kinds of things bombarding us. And the scripture is saying, lead a quiet and peaceful life. The pastor, how do you expect me to lead a quiet and peaceful life. How is it ever going to be possible for me to do that? Well, take charge. Take charge of your schedule. Take charge of what you say yes to and what you say no to. Take charge of your audio exposure and your multimedia exposure, things that are bombarding you. Be in charge. Quieten things down. For yourself. So, in the course of the week, have times of quietness for you, for yourself. Intentionally, have times of quietness. Just be in a place where you're quiet and peaceful. Make time for that. Take your foot off the gas pedal. Don't have to be always driving at 100 kilometers an hour. You can pull over to the side. Pause. Give yourself some time. Lead a quiet and peaceful life. You choose to base yourself. I know there are pressures. I know there are demands, and I know there are things that are pushing us. 
But then you and I make a deliberate choice. I need to be quiet. I need to live a quiet and peaceful life. And continues. Says, I want you to lead a quiet and peaceful life. And what's the next part? And mind your own. So when you tell somebody, mind your own business. Hey, you're quoting scripture. First Thessalonians 4.11. Just mind your own business. <laughs> you're quoting scripture. But think about how you would apply it to your own life. Paul actually elaborates this in his second epistle to the Thessalonians. He says, you know, I don't want you to be a busy body. You know, going here, listening to this story and going and telling that person what you heard over there and listening to that story and going and telling, don't be a busy body. Mind your own business. Now, minding our own business is so, so powerful because it actually does you and me a lot of good. It causes you and me to focus, deliberately focus the resources we have on what we are supposed to be doing. Your time, your energy, the resources you have, you deliberately put it all into the things that you are called to do. Your, your business. Mind your own business. Instead of spreading yourself thin and wasting your time and energy in everybody else's business, when you mind your own business, you're really focusing in on what you should be doing. Amen? So mind your own business. Deliberately stay out of putting your nose in other people's business. Focus on what you need to do. What God has called you to do. What you're responsible for here and now. Stay out of other people's things. That doesn't mean we don't care. That doesn't mean we don't help. We do. But do it in the measure that God, that, that's reasonable, that's practical. But focus in on what God's given you to do. Mind your own business. Live a quiet and peaceful life. Mind your own business. And then he says, work with your own hands as we commanded you. Work with your own hands. Paul gets a little stronger on this in his second epistle to the Thessalonians. He says, if anyone doesn't work, let him not eat. Finish. Oh, yeah. That's pretty strong. At least now he's a little gentle. Work with your own hands. Next epistle, he gives one more big left hook. If you don't eat, don't work, don't eat. Pretty strong. Instructing them, hey, work with your own hands. Why? So that you can have a good testimony with those who are outside. He says that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Let people from the outside, when they look at you, let them see you, that you're living a quiet and peaceful life, that you are minding your own business, that you are working with your own hands, and that all your needs are well cared for. You lack nothing. You are working with your own hands, and when they see you, they see you living properly. Amen? So we have to, as believers, live like this. Try to put this in a practice in your own life. Live a quiet and peaceful life. Mind your own business. Work with your own hands. Walk properly to those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. The last passage, First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. You're still with me? Verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus, sh thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Worship team, please come. So now Paul is turning his attention to the coming of the Lord. He's spoken about holiness. He's spoken about increasing in love. He's spoken about, you know, our day-to-day -day conduct. This is how we live life. And then he says, okay, I want you to know something about the coming of the Lord. He's encouraging their hearts. He's saying, you know, those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, they've gone, their spirits are with the Lord. And a time is coming when the Lord will return. There'll be the sound of the archangel. There'll be the trumpet blowing. There'll be the shout. And God, the Lord himself will descend. We who are alive, we, we are here on the earth at that time. Our bodies will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And those who are dead in Christ will arise with their glorified bodies. And our mortal bodies will be put on, will, mortal will put on immortality. And they will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to be with the, with the Lord forever. Comfort one another with these words. I just want to point out one thing. You see, that word rapture, it's not in the Greek, it's not in the English, but it comes from the Latin Bible. In Latin, when it says, caught up together. I don't know Latin, but I know these two words. <laughs> Simul rapior, meaning together we will be raptured. So that's where you get the word rapture we'll be caught up together it comes to the latin so when we say we're going to be raptured yeah it's biblical not from the english but it comes from the latin word so we'll be caught up together we'll be raptured together to meet the lord in the air and he says you know when we see other believers die this is our comfort we all have to die. We all have to leave this planet at some point in time. But when we die in the law, our spirits are with Jesus. And a day is coming when we'll all come. And he will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, who have already died. And we who are alive, our bodies will be changed. And we will meet the Lord in the air. We'll be caught up together. We'll be raptured. And he'll be with the Lord. In chapter 1, he said, the Lord is coming to deliver us from the wrath to come. How is that going to happen? Here's a little understanding. He's going to come to take us out and away from the wrath to come. Amen. There's more on this in chapter 5 and then in 2 Thessalonians. We'll, we'll trace the thread throughout his, both these letters and put the pieces together. What would Paul write to us if he had to write to us today? I'm sure he's going to say, please lead a quiet and peaceful life. That's so important for us. What will he testify to us today? he say, look, there was a time the Holy Spirit told me to keep moving. I moved on. There was a time that Satan hindered me. But God had a way. Such a wonderful thing. He worked out in these areas. He did even beyond what I could imagine. He did it. What would Paul tell us if he was writing to us today? It's a, in your day, in your time. When there's all kinds of perversion around you, I want you to possess your own body in sanctification and honor. The same things he told them, he's going to tell you and me. Because you've been called to holiness. You've been called for that. Amen. Let's rise to our feet, please. I want us to take some time just to pray. 
Maybe something you heard this morning. God is taking that and speaking it to your spirit and saying, this is what I want you to work on. Maybe something you heard this morning. The Holy Spirit is reaffirming, is reinforcing that in your heart. I want to just invite you to open up your heart and speak to Him and say, yes, Lord, I receive what you are speaking to me this morning. And Father, I just ask that the Holy Spirit will empower each of us to walk in the truth of your word. Even as your word has been proclaimed, even as your word has been shared amongst us, Father, let the Spirit of the living God move upon each of us, move upon our hearts and minds, and speak to us. Administer this to us. We look to you, God. And you deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name you are great you do miracles so great there is no one else like you there is no one else like you for you are great you do miracles so great there is no one else like you Father, we just speak the empowering of your Holy Spirit on each of us, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of your Spirit, God, to help each of us to walk in kingdom truth, 
to walk in the truth of your words. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit will teach us how to live quiet and peaceful lives amidst all the noise and the busyness and the pull and the pressures that we face. I ask that the Holy Spirit will anoint each of us and empower each of us to possess our own vessels in holiness and in honor. That every single one of us in this place will be men and women empowered by the Holy Spirit who choose holiness, purity, an honor. Father, I pray that each one of us will walk in a manner worthy of the name of the Lord and so that when those outside look at us, they will see that we are the people of God. Do a powerful work in each of us today by your Spirit, Father. Do a powerful work in each of our lives. And we thank you. We praise you. We honor you. Maybe stand firm in who you've called us to be and the kind of people you've called us to be. Maybe stand firm in the calling with which you've called us. We thank you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.